Welcome to part 2 of this tutorial series where we're making a multiplayer game in Unity. In this one we'll be implementing player movement and setting up some animations, but if you haven't watched part 1, you'll probably want to go do that first. As always, all the code for this is on GitHub, and if you've got questions, feel free to join the Discord server and ask there. Since the last video, I've released version 1.2.0 of Riptide, so we're going to start off by updating the project to use that. The link to the repository is in the description, and you can find the DLL and XML files in the releases section. Once you've downloaded those, open the server project and delete the existing files. Then drag the new ones in, and that's it. Do the same thing for the client project as well. One thing that's new in version 1.2.0 is that the create method for messages can take in enums directly. Casting it to a uShort will still work just fine, but from now on we won't be bothering with that, so to keep things consistent, I'm going to remove it from the existing messages as well. In the UI manager send name method, remove the cast to a U short. Then on the server, do the same thing in the player class's to send spawned methods. When implementing your movement logic, one big consideration is cheat prevention. If you're new to developing multiplayer games, one thing you'll learn pretty quickly is that clients can't be trusted. Any decisions or calculations that you do trust clients with opens a door for cheats and exploits. Movement is a prime example of this. If you allow clients to calculate their own positions, a hacker can fairly easily exploit that to move in ways that you may not have intended. Anything from teleporting to flying to walking straight through walls becomes possible. In some games, particularly co-op and other non-competitive ones, that may not really be a concern, but in this video we'll be making the server calculate all movement, and we're going to start by making the client send the player's inputs over. We'll need a few new files for this, so create three scripts called Player Controller, Camera Controller, and Player Animation Manager. Open the Player Controller class and add a reference to the camera's transform and a bool array to store the inputs. In Start, initialize the array. Although we'll be sending the inputs from fixed update, we're going to sample them in update to avoid missing any key presses that might happen between fixed update calls. Then in fixed update, call send input, which we'll create in a moment, and then add a for loop that resets our array of input bools. Next, create the send input method. Inside, we'll create a message, which obviously requires a reference to the Riptide networking namespace. Because we're sending the input consistently every time fixed update runs, it doesn't really matter if a message is lost here and there, so we're going to use the unreliable message send mode. Open up the network manager and add an ID for our input message to the client to server ID enum. While we're here, let's also add the ID for the movement message that the server will be sending back to clients. Back in the player controller, pass the new ID to the message.create method and add the inputs array to the message. Make sure to pass in false for the include length parameter. This will prevent Riptide from writing the length of the array into the message, which is fine in this case because we know our inputs array will always consist of the same number of elements so we'll be able to manually pass that length in on the other end, and thereby save a little bit of bandwidth. After that, add the camera transforms forward vector to the message and send it to the server. Open the network manager again and copy the two message ID enums. Then in the server project, create a new script called player movement. Next, open the server's network manager and replace the two enums with the ones we copied from the client code. The player movement class will rely on the character controller component, so add a require component attribute for that. Then create references for the player and character controller components, as well as a reference to the transform that will represent the player's camera. We'll also need fields for gravity, movement speed, and jump height. To store the actual values we'll be using in our movement calculations, add more fields for the gravity acceleration, move speed, and jump speed. And finally, we need a bool array for inputs and a float to store the current y velocity since the character controller doesn't store velocity. We can use onValidate to assign our controller and player references and to calculate the values for gravity acceleration, move speed, and jump speed anytime a value is changed in the inspector. In start, assign a value to our inputs array. Since we want to make sure our movement values actually get calculated in builds and not just in the editor, we need to do that in start as well. So add a quick initialize method and then call that from onValidate and start. Next, create a move method. Inside, we're going to multiply the 2D input directions to axes with the camera's right and forward vectors to get a vector 3 in world space. If the player isn't looking straight ahead though and has their camera at an angle, we don't want to move vertically when pressing W, so let's make sure to flatten the camera's forward vector. 
Then multiply the move direction by the move speed, and if the sprint key is pressed, double the move direction. If the player is standing on something, we want to reset its Y velocity, and if the jump key is pressed, we want to set the Y velocity to the jump speed. Don't forget to add the gravity acceleration to the Y velocity. Finally, set the move direction's Y component to the Y velocity, call the character controller's move method, and then call send movement. By the way, if you want to use your own movement logic instead of what we've set up here, this is where you do that. None of this logic really has anything to do with multiplayer, so as long as you make sure clients send their input and the server sends back the updated position, you can pretty much just swap the rest out. In fixed update, we'll sample the inputs array and create a vector 2 out of it. Call the move method at the end. Of course, we're still not setting the inputs array anywhere, so create a method to do that. Next, add the send movement method and create a message inside. This message will update clients with the player's position and the way they're facing, so add those vector 3s to the message along with the player's ID and then send it to all clients. We still need to actually handle the input message, so let's do that. Over in the player class, add a reference to the player movement script. Then create a message handler method for the input message ID. Inside, we'll grab the appropriate player instance from the dictionary and call its player movement component set input method. Make sure you pass in the length of the bool array to the getBools method, which in this case is 6. Back over in the client code, let's handle the movement message. In the handler method, grab the appropriate player instance, call its move method, and pass it the two vector 3s that are in the message. Then create set move method. Inside, we're just going to set the player's position to the one that was received, and if the player is not the local player, we'll update their camera transform's forward direction, which will obviously require a reference to that transform. The check for whether or not this is the local player is particularly important here, as we don't want to overwrite the rotation of the local player's camera. That would cause conflicts with the rotation that the client calculated while the server was still processing previous input, and jittering when simply moving your mouse around is something we really want to avoid. Unfortunately, that means we're trusting players to calculate their own rotation. Making the server calculate player rotation simply causes too many problems in responsiveness to really work. Even if the server only accepted the player's mouse input, it really wouldn't be too difficult to make the client calculate what kind of mouse movement would rotate you to be aiming right at someone, and then sending that to the server. So logistically, it would be really difficult to make server authoritative rotation work, and in the end it wouldn't even be preventing cheating. That's basically why aimbots exist for pretty much every game out there. Back in Unity, open up the local player prefab and attach the player controller script to it. Then assign the camera's transform to the two slots. In the server project, open the player prefab and attach the player movement script. Create a transform that's in the same position as your client side local player prefab's camera and drag that into the cam proxy slot. Make sure you assign the player movement script to the player components field and set the gravity, movement speed, and jump height values. You can obviously play around with these values, and you'll likely want a smaller jump height than the three units I've set here. Also, if your player model isn't the size of a default Unity capsule, make sure to adjust the size and position of the character controller. If you start the server now and connect the client, you'll notice the player just falls into the void, so add a plane as the ground on both the server and the client, and make sure they're in the same position. The server side plane is the important one because that's where the movement is calculated, but you probably want to be able to see the ground, which is why it's needed on the client as well. Then start the server again and reconnect the client, and you should be able to move around now. We haven't added any code to let you rotate your camera, so let's do that next. Open the camera controller class and add fields for the player component, sensitivity, and vertical clamp angle. Add fields for the vertical and horizontal rotation as well. In onValidate, we can assign the player reference. In Start, set the vertical rotation to the camera's local rotation around the x-axis, and set the horizontal rotation to the player's rotation around the y-axis. The reason we're splitting these like this is because we want to rotate the whole player object around the y-axis, but only the camera around the x-axis. In Update, we want to toggle the cursor mode if the Escape key was pressed, and if the cursor is locked, we want to let the player look around. At the end, we'll just draw a ray in the player's view direction for debugging purposes. In the look method, we're going to sample the mouse input, use it to calculate the new vertical and horizontal rotation, and then apply those values. 
To toggle the cursor mode, we're just going to toggle whether or not the cursor is visible, and then we'll switch the lock state based on what the current lock state is. Back in Unity, attach the camera controller to the local player prefab's camera. If you connect to the server now, you should be able to look around. If moving your mouse doesn't cause any rotation, you may need to click the window and press escape a few times. One thing you might notice is that the movement feels kind of jittery. It might be especially difficult to see it here in this video, but if you rotate your camera while moving around, it becomes rather obvious that the movement is not smooth. This happens because when the client receives a position update, it literally just teleports the player to that new position. The only reason it looks as smooth as it does is because of how often this happens every second. To deal with this, you'll need to interpolate between the player's current position and the new one that was just received from the server, but we'll do that in a future video. Next, we're just going to add some simple animations to the player. As you can see, I've got a folder in the client project that contains animations for idling, walking, and sprinting. These are all extremely basic and just change the player's scale on the y-axis at different speeds. If you want to use the same ones, you can grab them from GitHub, or you can use your own animations. To make these work, create an animator controller and open it up. Then drag the three animations into the animator window. Next, create two bool parameters called isMoving and isSprinting. We'll be using these to determine which animation to play. After that, create transitions between our three animation states. Now let's set up the conditions for these transitions. To go from idle to walking, is moving needs to be true and is sprinting needs to be false. To go back to idle, both bools need to be false. To go from walking to sprinting, we just need to check if is sprinting is true as a player that is sprinting will obviously also be moving. To go from sprinting to walking, the player needs to be moving but not sprinting. Finally, to go from idle to sprinting, is sprinting needs to be true and to go back to idle, both bools need to be false. Open up the player prefab and create an empty game object called camp proxy because we didn't do that earlier. Put it in the same position as the local player's camera object. Then drag it into the player component's slot as a reference. Because I don't want my movement animations to overwrite my model's scale, I'm going to create an empty game object with a scale of 1, make the model a child of it, and then attach the player animation controller to it. Next, open the player animation manager and create a field for the animator, player move speed, sprint threshold, and last position. In start, set the sprint threshold. We multiply the player move speed by 1.5 because when you sprint, your movement speed is doubled, and we need the threshold to be somewhere between the walk and sprint speeds. Then create a method which will set the animation controller's bools. Inside, we're going to calculate the distance that the player has moved since the last physics step, ignoring the Y component so that jumping or falling off a cliff doesn't trigger the walk or sprint animations. Then we'll set the isMoving and isSprinting bools, but make sure you don't set the same one twice like I did here. Finally, we need to update the last position. In the player class, add a reference to the player animation manager, and then call its animate based on speed method from inside the move methods is local check. Like I mentioned before, make sure you pass in the correct names for the bools in the animate based on speed method. Back in Unity, attach the player animation manager to the player prefab, assign the appropriate references, and set the player move speed to whatever you set it to on your server. If you build the client now and connect to the server twice, you should see the other player getting animated based on their movement speed. Finally, there's a few things we should clean up from the previous video. In the client's network manager's did disconnect method, we should make sure to destroy all existing player objects in the scene so that reconnecting to a server doesn't leave you with more and more game objects building up. Then in the player left method, instead of assuming the player we want to destroy exists in the dictionary, add an if statement to check if that's really the case and only then call the destroy method. We'll do the same thing on the server, so copy paste that change over to the server's network manager's player left method. Anyways, make sure you smash the like button if you found this helpful. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.